Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out. I know it's uh, the end of the day, and uh, hopefully this one gives you, walks, makes you walk away with some energy and some pep and a, a whole new project you'd like to join me and work on. So for a show of hands, how many people saw my Cartesian genetic programming talk before? Fantastic. Okay, for those of you that did not, I'm going to skim through some of the material that was already covered there in the interest of not boring 85% of the audience. So, democracy, we got to go with it. All right. So, again, presentation protocol dictates you need this header. So, I have to tell you about this stuff. This is uh, what I'm going to tell you. So, now you've been told what I'm going to tell you. But the interesting thing, like most interesting things, is down here in this gray area, there's kind of a morality lesson to be had there at the end. And I found it very interesting. It was very exciting for me with this research. Uh, which came together right at the end. I wasn't sure which way the morality was going to go on the airplane here, so it was very exciting right towards the end. And I can't wait to share that with you. But first off, you must understand the, uh, the mindset. What leads a person to want to evolve a custom communication protocol uh, uh, besides hacking? And for me, uh, how many saw the part-time scientist presentation? All right, a couple, okay. We're sending a rover to the moon. So something about the size, uh, about this podium laid down with wheels, drives around. It'll actually go to the moon in a couple of years, sooner, if we can help it. And we need a communication protocol to talk to our rover, as uh, there are some special needs there. So we had to devise one. And, you know, the technical statement, what we're looking for is, you know, your classic given and create. So there's a fixed set of hardware we have to deal with. I don't get to choose that hardware. Much like most of us don't get to choose the hardware in the ATMs or anything, we have to deal with the, some of this hardware. I work with somebody who can choose hardware right here in the front row, so you know, I'll, direct, I'll direct negative questions to him. Uh, we have video and data telemetry streams coming down from the moon and being received at large satellite dishes on Earth. And on Earth, we have human drivers sitting there, and they're watching this video and this telemetry about temperatures and batteries, and they're sending up commands up to the rover. So we have two types of data coming down and one type of data coming up. So we have different, you know, th essentially three distinct sets of data streams that have to flow, flow here. And our, you know, our, our technical comp sci, make my college professor proud, is we need to make a finite state machine to do application and network layer control for a symmetric transceiver that's identical on Earth and the moon. All right, so we're building a transceiver, we're building a finite state machine, and we got to deal with these three separate things. It's not quite that simple. We can't just sit down and sketch it. We have some constraints. First off, um, a major option for us in this thing, in this this contest to send a rover to the moon is to use the public airwaves, ham radio, amateur band radio, which means we must be open, published protocol, cannot use encryption. Every one of you in here must be able to look at any packet we get and be able to decipher it and tell what was in it. We also have very long latencies. It takes a second and a half or so for light to get from Earth to the moon and then the response to get back. And that doesn't sound so bad, but try remote controlling a car where your eyes are blindfolded and you have one and a half seconds to three, actually three second delay from the time you say turn left to the time you see it bump into the wall because you did it the wrong time. It's, it's uh, a little tricky, but it is part of the protocol we must deal with. Um, our packets are very precious to us. When they, when they leave that rover, they represent an investment in energy that we could have used to move that rover or to maintain the temperature on the battery and let the rover survive longer. We chose instead to put that energy into the radio communication system for that one packet. So we have to be very careful with what packets we send. We can't send every packet 10 or 20 or 30 times just to make sure it gets there. Uh, we have to be careful. And if we lose too many packets, we won't be able to prove that our rover was there or that it drove far enough on the moon and we lose 10, 20, 30 million US dollars. So these packets are very precious to us, but we can't send too many of them because energy is precious too. Bandwidth, uh, infinite bandwidth? No, 
not in the infinity of space. It's limited and it's saturated with the video stream that's mandatory to win the prize. So we've already saturated that. Um, and once our, once our uh, communication packets get down to earth and they land, end up these big dishes, maybe down in Australia, maybe in your backyard, they're going to get tunneled through somebody else's protocol and wind up at a central station. And TCPIP is not an option for us. Basically, uh, connection-oriented protocols aren't, aren't really an option. It's because maintaining that with the latency just works out to be really bad. So I know how to do this process. You know how to do this process. You sit down with everyone involved and you debate. And you come up with a design and you debate it. And you come up with a design, you debate that, and then somebody brings up the debate you had last week about last week's design. And you just keep doing this cycle. Um, I love math equations for simple things humans do, so that's a shameless math equation. There aren't too many of them in this. So once your arguments settle down, and all your, you're not really debating algorithm anymore on the protocols, you're debating timing statistics, you're debating parameters, knobs you can tune and adjust. Great, then you just build a parameterized algorithm where you can plug and play these parameters. Maybe you pound define them in your code and you just do a little one-off simulations to see how it's running. That works for about an hour. And you start emailing people and they're like, oh, what about this combination, what about that combination? So you're like, okay, fine. We're going to try all combinations so you end up with big arrays, and we've got more arrays in the, the stuff we tried. Big arrays of parameters you can try. And I'm sure anybody had to do this kind of stuff? A couple of hands, fantastic, thank you. I'm not alone, I love this conference. So you end up sweeping through all of these, and you've got to do them at random, and you have to do these parameter sweeps. And this is good for about a day until you realize my computer's busy and I'd like to play games on it. There must be a faster way to get this. So you start to say, all right, fine, I'm going I'm to learn GPU programming. I'm going to push this stuff to a GPU where I can do it faster. And I will say we had great luck with this. We had great luck with it, but uh, it's not the end of our project. We, uh, we, we ported unoptimized C++ code to, a, to a, an NVIDIA GPU. Unoptimized just to see if it worked. And it was kind of, kind of interesting is that one second for a simulation outside of the GPU, 700 seconds for that simulation on the GPU, which normally a 700 to one slowdown is pretty miserable, right? But you can do so many of them at the same time on the GPU that it netted a seven times speed up, which was cool. So now I could let the thing run for a couple for a weekend or so, and I came out with all the simulations we needed, which was great because then I could turn into my boss and the rest of the group, hey, look, we've got results. We can stop arguing. We're almost done with this project. Not done with the presentation, nobody leave. And you end up with this China chart. Say, let's look at how many communication outages we had in the simulation. And let's look at how far the rover was able to travel. We'd measure wheel ticks, 1,024 ticks, how far the wheel's able to move. Because if we move far enough, we win money. So wheel ticks, very important mission parameter for us. And then we start to say, okay, if I send you a packet, and I don't hear back from you in five seconds, I'll send it again, so that's our timeout, or I could wait 30 seconds. Which of those leads to a better mission? And if you've got really, really, really terrible communications, yeah, they're about the same. If you've got pretty good communications, you want short timeouts, and you can recover. But you know, now we have numbers. No more gut feel, numbers, and we can move on. And uh, I thought we were done. I was pretty pleased with that. We've got 20 or 30 pages of these graphs and some recommendations for all the parameters. Like, okay, hallelujah, done. Wait, 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 wait. Then, in the nature of any kind of project where you're not necessarily in control, uh, a few small changes come up. You know, the, the boss in our case is talking to new sponsors, talking to new potential uh, sponsors, partners, anything. And the rules start to change in little subtle ways for us software people. You know, we tend to have to implement these dreams and communication protocols, not, not any different than that. So our little algorithm had to change here. So given changing requirements, we must complete a continuous loop of do this over and over and over. 
At all times, we need a working communication protocol because we have to be able to demonstrate at any time. But every time we talk to somebody, we need to be able to tweak that protocol, maybe for their network, maybe for their concerns, their IT department gets involved. You know, you talk with somebody who's got a host of big dishes, they want you to tweak the protocol a little to be friendly with their software. Okay, well, how do I tweak, tweak that without breaking anything? And anybody been in this kind of situation? All right, fantastic. All right, that'll give you a headache. But I think in general, we all know what to do here. Wait for it. So in general, we all sit down and we're like, okay, let's over-design this thing. There was no laughter from the crowd. This is a big deal. Anyway, I thought this was hilarious. My boss wants to put this on my cube. Um, it's like, okay, I know how to solve this problem in general. And it means skipping the human debate and it means moving to computer algorithm invention and with my new favorite thing, Cartesian genetic programming. Moving to that where we show up with inputs, outputs, we show up with packets we want sent and things we want, metrics we want from our communication stream and we stop arguing over the algorithm and let the computer come up with the algorithm for us. We actually, you know, this is a, a slide from before. Anybody recognize this one? Yeah, yeah, excellent. We start inventing algorithms that look like this. We start letting the computer stay. I've got a series of inputs. I'm going to connect them up this way and see how it does. We start to get into genetic programming, actual algorithm invention, and just take the whole human debate out of this and just be confident that we have a process that's going to work over and over and over. So very briefly, um, because, again, most hands went up when I said, have I already told you about Cartesian genetic programming? Um, we like it because it generates circuit-like things, and circuit-like things are very important on this mission because we're using FPGA circuits, which can be reprogrammed, and we need the ability on an FPGA chip to send communication packets that are caught by the FPGA and used to rewrite the OS level in our, our system. So there may be cases where the hardware has to catch packets and process them in hardware instead of just having so all the full abilities of you know, megabytes worth of RAM available to software. Hard, some hardware implementation has to be handy. So it's very important for our mission. And we try to keep it pretty simple, whatever hardware could handle. All right, random circuits, shake it all up after scoring it. Things get a little better, repeat. Okay, everyone remember this little terminology here? Excellent. I did tell you there's a quiz last time, right? All right, this stuff ran so slow. <laughs> this new way of doing it for communication protocols ran so slow, I actually had to put a few hours into optimization, dynamic optimization. The key thing with to optimize performance of Cartesian genetic programming is to look through the grid, trace back through the outputs everything that's actually needed, and when you execute, only execute those nodes. The nodes are trivial. You're adding two numbers together, but yet if you can wrap that with an, with an if data at some Boolean pointer, if you can wrap that, uh, you really do get like a five or six times speed up because it turns out Cartesian genetic programs tend to be very large. You know, they tend to be, they find that uh, researchers say 4,000 nodes will evolve faster and better solutions in, than, uh, say, 500 nodes, even though they may have the same number of active genes at any given instance in time. It's something about uh, the, search, the search algorithm. So this is critical for speed ups. So we will skip that little bit of code overview where I show you individuals, which is really just an array of floats, how they're executed. Optimization is pretty simple. That'll be in the code that's released for this project. And let's get more to goals of the attacker. Let's start talking about the simulation we have to do, the things that are really different than what you saw maybe at the prior presentation. The attacker's got some serious goals. We need an attacker in this mission because we have to, we have to say, we have, we have to know. We're, we're talking public, which means anybody in this room, including me if I was bored, could try to mess with this mission. 
and we have to say what what are that what are the attackers goals here first and foremost the attackers trying to take over the rover if the attacker can drive that rover over a cliff they only need to give one command you know get a command in there to get it over the cliff before we can get a command to it telling it to stop and they win all right so one, one rightfully placed command could make all the difference. So that's a mission ender for us. They could also make the rover just sit there, make it ignore anything we send it. Get it confused, make it trust the authority of ground control would also end our mission as well because if we can't drive, we can't win. Um, also, if we can't prove the video was authentic, we, we lose as well. So if they're able to confuse our ground station about the authenticity of the video coming from space, that would also break the mission. Um, other high risks are confusing the human drivers with false telemetry. They might still rely on the video, but if they're looking at the data, the, the AI on the ground, making risk assessments would be questioning what the humans are trying to do. And we'd have to switch over into a total manual mode and that gets really dangerous. Um, they could also delay execution of rover commands, which would bake the rover in the sun before it got far enough. So there are, there are some bad things you can do here. Um, so armed with those goals of the attacker, we created a discrete event system simulation, which sounds fancy and I'll show you the code to say this is really simple, trivial code and I hope all of you are engaged enough to try it. Um, queue of events, actually it's ended up implementing it not even as a queue because you end up don't needing the new and deletes if you can avoid that. Um, set of actors on stage taking part in the simulation and just a few little details about packets. For simulation purposes, a packet is a payload of data. It's a command lump of, it's a lump containing a command or video or telemetry. It's, that lump has an ID so we know which lump it is, it's command number 7,000. And then it's a series of header control flags that tell you what to do, what, what to do with that and whether that's you know, authentic or not. And it's also, also a signature, like an error recovery signature. You know. And we also introduce actor, uh, outer space. So we've got the transceivers we're building, we've got outer space, and we've got the attacker. Outer space is kind of interesting. I tried this simulation without outer space, or I should say with a perfect outer space that just, no attacker, and it just let packets flow. And um, I would be embarrassed to call that code because what came out of the system was essentially, you know, um, trivial. You know, if true, blah, you know, I mean, it's, you end up with nothing that would pass any kind of robustness. So at a minimum, we found that you need some kind of at least trivial attacker, in our case outer space, in the simulation in order to evolve a communication protocol. And we gave this one the ability to just lose packets. So hey, hey ground control, I got this video. Ground control, I never heard it, never got it. We can replay, space could cause a data packet to somehow get echoed around and have ground control see the same video frame twice or the rover to see the same command twice. Um, the rover might also see its own video packets coming back, echoed back to it. And any of these packets anywhere at any time could be corrupted, but some potentially even beyond the ability of whatever um, forward error correction is put on the packets. So space, is, uh, space plays dice, but is kind of harsh on the packets. So next in the, communica next in the, uh, the structure of our communic communication system, as we look at the transceiver as a set of, as a set of chromosomes, uh, Cartesian genetic programming chromosomes, but they're really actors. So when the simulation says, I have a video packet that has to go, okay, this guy, data ready to transmit, that actor is going to be engaged and that actor, that packet we presented the actor, and the actor will tell us what control flags to put in the packet, whether or not to even send it. Uh, and then likewise, when data comes in, how to deal with it, including the choice of whether to accept it or reject it. So you don't have to accept every command that comes in, you can just discard it. And then we gave also the ability to have a, um, a queue of command packets, up to 10 command packets, some small hardware thing. 
And if any of those sit in that queue for too long, then those get expired. Uh, because it turned out adding that saved a whole lot of uh, mental hassle about how to figure out how to evolve that functionality. So there's still, still a little hand of God that had to be dipped into the evolution there. Wanted to point out uh, some feedback from the last one, uh, Cartesian genetic programming, is that we made heavy use of chromosomes in this case. Uh, a key tenet of genetic programming is the copying of partial solutions from one generation into the next. So don't just take the best one and move it forward. Take some part of one that wasn't so good and move it forward as well. And Cartesian genetic programming does that through the use of its chromosomes. We use the uh, complex chromosomes from the prior lecture to uh, really make, really accelerate this. They're scored separately, promoted separately, and you end up making super individuals at next generation that contain the best way of doing everything. Don't worry, I'm building to that gray moral in the gray area here. Stay with me. All right, so our attacker is almost Superman. Our attacker is co-evolved. Every time the transceiver gets a chance to improve, so does the attacker. So they are, they are neck and neck for as much computation effort as available. Our attacker has full knowledge of that packet structure, so there's no reverse engineering the attacker has to do here. Our attacker can crack our private keys. We presume that if an attacker has seen a certain number of video packets, that they will be able to reverse engineer the private key used to create and sign those packets. So I think consider that a worst case. No matter how many bits we want to put that in, we assume the attacker can crack that and has a large bank of computers trying to help them with it. We assume that the attacker sees every communication between the ground and the rover. You cannot hide anything from this attacker. However, the attacker cannot be man in the middle. We are sending through space to dishes on the Earth. The attacker does not have a satellite that can block those signals and retransmit them. So man in the middle is not allowed in this scheme. Uh, it would be interesting to see what could come up with, but it's not something we simulated. The attacker is able to send to the moon. The attacker is able to send to the ground stations, although there is a risk when sending. If an attacker were to send through radio to a ground station, the ground station would recognize that it did not come from the moon and that it was from an attacker. And you may have you know, to move shortly because there is somebody who's going to start tracking down that transmission. So when an attacker transmits to the ground station, their best bet is physical attack on the network lines and to inject packets in that way, not to transmit them over the radio. Okay? But we assume that the, pa the attacker has that advanced ability to get those, their packets into the data stream as if they came from the moon. So I consider that Superman. Uh, perhaps other people know other advanced, other abilities the, packer sh the uh, attacker should have, but I, I think that's a pretty, pretty harsh attacker to evolve with. Furthermore, the attacker we consider is stateful. So it sees every packet and then it makes the decision to send a packet that goes out. And who would I send that to or should I even send a packet? It maintains a full state machine for itself as well as has a timer. So it can get poked even when there isn't a packet arrived. That allows it to launch a denial of service attack. The attacker is also very large, computationally large, which is why these simulations run so unbelievably slow. Um, it's much, much, much larger than any of, the, um, any of the Cartesian genetic grids we did for the transceiver. So it's to, again to mimic an attacker with many resources behind it. So we tried to give the attacker every advantage we could. And then we're very close to code, and then we'll start talking some uh, philosophy here. So when you look at these simulations, you have to look at uh, fitness, okay? And so when you take one of these individuals, a potential protocol you evolved, you run it through the simulation and you see how well it did. How well it did, that score is its fitness. And the idea of Darwinian, Darwinian uh, idea that the strongest survive, the most fit survive. Uh, in the, the data you'll see here, the most fit are the ones that made the fewest mistakes so they have the lowest score, all right? I personally find it easier to write complaints than praise. So the, the fewer complaints, the lower the score, the, and therefore the more fit. So when you see charts going down, it's getting better. All right. 
So every generation, you have fitness, and then every once in a while, you'll do something that's better than you've ever seen before, and that becomes your best fitness so far. And so you'll see generational fitness do something, you'll see best fitness step down. And every time you come up across something that's better than you've ever seen before, you stop and you do a validation. You say, okay, well, I've done my little simulation. I want to do a very harsh simulation. I want to do the real job. How well does this best thing that I've just found, how well does it do against a real validated test? And that's under the idea that the validated fitness is ridiculously hard and ridiculously expensive computationally to do. So you're taking a little shortcut by doing fitness, a smaller fitness evaluation in order to do the evolution. And in our case, we have a series of penalties here. So if I'm the transceiver and I get a packet in, I'm like, hey, I like this packet, but it's signed with the wrong key. Okay, penalty. <laughs> Success for the attacker. That's a reward for the attacker. So it's plus equals fitness for the transceiver and minus equals fitness, which is a good thing for the attacker. Um, accepted a packet that came from the attacker, accepted unknown data lump, so if somebody offers me data lump 7,000, whether it's command 7,000 or whatnot, and that just doesn't exist and I still accept it, that's a problem. Um, if I accept a command more than once, that's not necessarily a mission ender. If I say accept the turn left command, command number 7,000, turn left, accept that twice. That's not necessarily a mission ender because somebody might still be able to write a little code to detect that and only execute that command once, but it's still a hassle they have to deal with, so there's still a penalty there. Uh, likewise, if I turn back every packet, I say, well, I'm doing terrible by accepting all this stuff, so I'm just going to close the door. Well, that's still a bad thing. There's still a penalty there. Uh, and so forth. Oh, and the attacker, we spank the attacker every time this transceiver does something right. Anytime a valid command actually got through, we tell the attacker, you did something wrong, you can do better. So I will say this list was not the list we first started with and that we had to evolve during this. Okay, There's, there are some tips about this. One very important thing is, remember I said we have to validate when things go, when you come up with something better, you have to do some validation. <laughs> Uh, this is the type of chart you'd want to do, is you want to do a whole bunch of probing runs, and then you want to look at the fitness and validated fitness who come out of those, and you need to make sure they are correlated. It doesn't need to be a nice straight line, okay? It doesn't get all straight liney down here, so don't worry about that, that fit. But it is a monotonically increasing thing. It does have a good Spearman's fit. Uh, it's important to say the little tiny fitness that I run is well correlated to the much more expensive validation that I run because if things validate well, then I'll accept that into the mission. So overall things you want to look at is, well, can you do, can you evolve a communication protocol with Cartesian genetic programming? Is it robust? I mean, is it actually useful? Um, and if you'd had to do it again, can you do it in isolation? Do you have to have only poor signal quality like outer space? Was that enough? Or do you have to have an attacker? And kind of interestingly, if you had an attacker, does an attacker evolve faster than the communication protocol? Does one win? Is there a winner here? That would be of interest. All right, so I want to show you some code quickly. How are we doing on time? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I don't have my watch. Okay. So main loop. Yeah, yeah, I should have bookmarked these. Okay, so you ready, blah blah blah. So your structure is you have an experiment, of course. And your experiment, here we go. Your experiment contains you know, nifty little run. You want to run your experiment. You're going to, to run an experiment, you create a series of worlds. And in each world, you assign it a program to run for packet received, data ready, packet expired, and an attacker. And what you want to do is combine every attacker with every individual. 
So if you have if you have four attackers and you have you have four individuals up here, you've got 16 worlds you need. And then you need to do these worlds a whole bunch of times because it's stochastic. It's got to be random. We'll talk about that why that has to be a little later. So it has to be random. So every every pairing has to have a whole bunch of runs to go with it. But each one of those runs is a world. That structure seemed to work pretty well. It kept the code easy to write. And uh, anybody use OpenMP? Am I the only one who uses OpenMP? Anybody use that? A few people? Okay. It's a super simple way of getting parallelism in your code. This little pragma says do every do this for loop, everything in here, as many cores as you have on your processor. So in my case, this will run uh, eight worlds at a time. And you turn it off for debugging. Now it runs one world at a time. You can deal with your pointer problems. In my case, I had a lot of pointer problems debugging through this. So narrowing it down to one world was very helpful. So execution's pretty simple. And then it's a matter of just going through, going through and totaling up the fitness for each of the, each of the worlds that you ran. How well did these things do in each of the worlds? Well, you know, in the first world, the uh, data ready, hey, I've got data, I want to send it out, that little program, that logic, might have done terrible, but the received one did pretty good. So you need to add up all those fitnesses, um, get them averaged out, a little cleanup, and then it's a matter of scrolling through, not the worlds, but the population, and say, who's got the best fitness so far? If anything got better, dump out some visualizations, do your validation. Pretty straightforward. Validation looks a lot like this, it just doesn't use an attacker. Validation is outer space on steroids. That's just noisy, I mean it has almost, you know, a 70% chance of echoing packets and corrupting packets. It's just the worst possible static you could imagine on the line to see how many commands can I actually get through there. So pretty straightforward stuff there. All right. So can Cartesian genetic programming make control logic? Yes. This is control logic for data ready for a, uh, just one of the random examples we ran. This is uh, an absence of an attacker. Yes. Absence of an attacker. And it's pretty straightforward once you get the hang of reading it. So my inputs are the state machine for the transmitter, the shared state across all chromosomes, the data type that's ready to be transmitted, the sequence number that would be assigned to the packet if one got sent, and the oldest sequence number that's sitting out there that we've not heard back from. So if we've sent 100 commands and we haven't heard about command 12, um, that sequence number would be out here. And then we're told, okay, update your own state, update the shared state. How do you want to sign this packet? And then give me two, f two control flags you want to put on the data packet. And then hopefully that'll be received and decoded by the out outside. Um, you've got some real garbage in here, I will admit. There's some junk. So normally what you would do if you were to convert this to real code, you would, you would auto-generate this into, say, C code, and then run that through, let the C code compiler tell you that transmit state greater than transmit state is always false, and then adding zero to that doesn't do anything, and negative zero doesn't do anything. So this is always gonna shove a zero to the shared state. So you'd let the compiler deal with that. That's nothing you have to bother writing, as long as you realize there's a next generation you do as code, code generation. Contrast that with control logic when you have an attacker. So, much bigger. Uh, to the point we had to get a little squinty, I'm sorry I couldn't fit it all on there. It was either that or cut off some of the spaghetti down here. Uh, there's a lot more control logic, you notice. Same size Cartesian genetic grid in both cases, but uh, more control logic evolves in the presence of an attacker, which I found interesting. Just Aesthetically, I find it more interesting. Um, there is a, 
There's a lot more uses of ors, there's some ands, there's some greater thans in here. Uh, I do find there's sort of a propensity to use constants, like this is testing to see if oldest sequence is greater than the constant seven. That's a little red flag to me about further research being needed. And that's, uh, that to me says this thing's memorized something about the number seven. There shouldn't be anything magical about a sequence number seven in a valid simulation. So there's a little, little unexpected, undesired memorization going on here, but it was getting close. Some tips when doing this, and I'm building, we're getting close, is you need to randomize everything because these little buggers will memorize things you don't expect. Like I first wrote the simulation, every sequence number started at one, and I intentionally just coded in, I took no, all randomness out, and I just said, you know, I'm gonna skip whatever the second command being sent is, I'm just gonna skip that and throw that away. These little buggers memorized that state machine instead of a generic communication state machine. They memorized that, ah, okay, sequence number three needs to be retrans, or sequence number two needs to be retransmitted, and didn't really do anything else beyond that, which was smart on their part, it's the minimum logic, it's technically correct, but I asked it the wrong question. We had a, uh, I know of a cat that uh, wanted treats, and the treats were in the cupboard, so it would stand there, and you uh, would open the door and it wouldn't move, so it would get hit in the head as the door opened. Well, the thing learned that if it didn't get hit in the head, it didn't get treats. No, the same kind of strangeness. <laughs> it didn't learn what you thought it would learn. So, but when you started randomizing those sequence numbers and start randomizing the gap between sequence numbers, so it doesn't go one, two, three, it might go one, 20, 22, 50, you start randomizing those, then it starts to evolve more general purpose things because you didn't realize you were presenting it with something it could lock onto. Um, at the same time, you want to reduce randomness in your fitness functions because fitness will vary all over the place and you might accidentally pick somebody who did well this time simply because the dice were in their favor. So you want to average things out. That's why we run things so many times to sort of average out the fit, average out the randomness we have to add to fitness. Um, thread safe random numbers, so you multi-thread this thing. Um, make sure you're using thread safe random numbers. You're gonna wonder why you get the same answer out of every thread and multi-threading didn't really change things. Yeah. Um, this was a fun one is watch what you're incentivizing as well. So I told the attacker, there's a, there's a risk. When you transmit, somebody can hunt you down, and they're gonna find you, they're gonna come get you. Well, the attackers figured out that the best thing to do was then to stay quiet and not attack. <laughs> so I had to give them a reward. So I know earlier I said there's a risk when transmitting, but to get the transceiver evolved that I wanted, I had to reward the hacker for, for doing, for actually hacking. Um, Another thing is, if you've got the computation power, is increase your population size. Most of the runs I did were at population size four, which is very standard for Cartesian genetic programming. And I left it at four because we had to run it, amplify it by like, you know, a couple hundred times for all the randomness. And I've seen it over and over that if you double, you double the population size, it triples the runtime. Okay, it triples the runtime but it halves the fitness, which means you get half as many complaints. You get a much better, a much better uh, critter out of the end of it. I've got a detailed slide on that if we have a, if we have a few seconds. And dust off your statistics book. Did anybody remember what a, what a t-test is? You do, all right, the angel knows. <laughs> but <laughs> I remembered that. There was something about a statistics prof griping me about that a long time ago, but you've got to dust that off. When you're looking at, say, 20 runs, and you've got averages, you're okay, well, this one's 4,000 and this one's 2,000. Well, is that good? And I say, well, you know, with the standard deviations and all these bell curves, there's a 50% chance that they're really the same population. You didn't really make an improvement. So you've got to dust off the old t-test, which thankfully Excel made easy for me to do. Okay, almost there. So without an attacker, here's representative of what we had happen. So fitness in orange. So every generation, fitness wobbles around. Every once in a while, you get a, you get a dip. So 
I'm logging these every thousand generations simply because I really didn't want to draw 200,000 dots for, I don't think the projector could handle it. Anyway, uh, fitness wobbles all around. There is a slight trend to that fitness. There is a slight downward trend to that. You can barely see it, but it is slight. And then every time you make an improvement, you get a dip into this best fitness. And you see that down here, and every time you change best fitness, you give a validation run. And you see validation, like I said, is space done wrong. Space, bad boy, as bad as it can be. It does terrible things to our packets. So that's life without an attacker. Here's life with an attacker. So, so this 30,000 mark right here, about where our fitness was there, average fitness is way up here off the screen. I had to trim it or we wouldn't be able to see any of the detail down here. Okay, this thing does, an attacker changes the landscape about generational fitness. Okay, it changes it drastically. Um, however, notice our best fitness is still down here in the 10,000 range and our validated fitness is still around the 30,000 range. Still around the 10,000, still around the 30,000 range, which is interesting, which is very interesting to me. And we're co-evolving an attacker and it's clearly much worse than outer space. I mean, it, it's clearly doing terrible things and yet we're still ending up with a pretty good product coming out of the end. So I thought that was very exciting. Then I asked, does an attacker help the process? It certainly, it certainly changes the process. It changes what we get out because we see we, see we have 50% more active genes in something that evolved with an attacker. So it's a more complicated, complicated program. And when we apply our statistics tests, we do see that the best fitness coming out with an attacker, um, this is technically a different number according to the old t-test. Um, these are a distri different distribution. At first I looked at that and I'm like, oh well, okay, I guess attackers make things worse. And, but you realize the attacker is really changing the rules of the game. Is adding a few extra packets. It's changing how you know the, the nature of the evaluation. So it's not fair to look at a total fitness. You've got to look at the validated fitness, which was the run that's all things equal, no attacker. It's just a really terrible outer space version. We could do a lot of the things attacker can, but it's not as aggressive or um, intelligent about it. Statistically, these are identical numbers. These are the same distribution. Now that's fascinating to me too is that even with an attacker evolving with all these benefits that a transceiver can still evolve, um, keep up with the attacker and still produce something that performs as well as if it had evolved without the attacker. So okay, to me that says, that doesn't say attacker helps or doesn't help, that just says the attacker changes things. Now, this is of interest too, is if we look at the generational fitness we see that without an attacker, the um, fitness is going down slightly. The, the validated fitness is dropping a little bit, or the fitness is dropping a little bit. So without an attacker, things are getting a little better over time. With an attacker, our fitness generation to generation isn't changing, isn't changing at all. The fitness functions are not. Um, they're very poorly correlated. There is no trend here, which to me says the attacker and the transceiver are locked, deadlocked. As one evolves, so does the other. Now I'm only looking every 1,000 1, generations, so there's bound to be peaks and valleys in there where some of them are going to happen. I'm not going to see that. But these two are locked into an eternal struggle with neither one winning and neither one losing, which I find very interesting. And yet, with neither one losing, with fitness not getting any better over time, we still produce just as well at our day job. Okay? We have the extra overhead to deal with the attacker and still deal with our day job. And then, if we look at, say, best fitness, validated fitness, the, the real criteria about how well things are coming out, you know, what's the end product? We see some noise in here fitness-wise. What's coming out of this thing? 
as we see, these things are about the same lines. The validated fitness and correlate and best fitness are coming out with about the same downward trend in both cases, except, and this is the beautiful part, this is the gray area morality, the validated fitness at the end of the simulation runs, and I had to do very short runs to get enough of them and done, done in time for the conference, but at the very short runs, the ones with an attacker are improving their validated fitness at double the pace of the ones evolving without an attacker. I find that an incredible morality lesson. It says if you want to produce a communication protocol that at the end of your process is going to be really good, you actually need an attacker to make that progress quickly because an attacker does accelerate the progress beyond a certain number of generations. It does improve your ability to, to produce good work. In fact, it outperforms the random space adversary we start with in terms of, uh, in terms of challenging your, your, uh, your evolved code. So can it do it? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm very comfortable with that. Um, is it robust? Can it work with poor signal quality? It seems to. I'd love to see a perfect one evolve yet, but I will say that has not happened, but I'd love to see it. I'm not sure if it is possible, though. I'd need to put a little more instrumentation in the code. Can it work with an attacker? Um, to paraphrase our team's logo, hell yeah, um, because it holds its own with an attacker. It doesn't lose ground, it doesn't gain ground, but it does hold its own. So to me, that says you should, you should evolve your control logic with an attacker and with a minor poor signal quality case to challenge both of them just in case. And that as long as you're willing to keep evolving your communication protocol, you can keep up with an attacker. Interesting experiments the future would be to run would be to pause that, to freeze, like set a standard for the communication protocol and see how just quickly an attacker can overwhelm it, uh, to see how mature you have to make a protocol before you freeze it. So future work, push this thing onto a GPU, a uh, lot more computations, a lot more at a time, especially the worlds, make our chromosomes finer so we can get, take more advantage of the genetic part of genetic programming. We need a little better, different selection technique than just choosing best uh, fitness because um, I have the feeling, I just have the gut feel that there are some good, good individuals sitting out there that the attacker is really challenged, they just haven't shown up yet. So I'd like to examine those, get into the whole notion of islands, so competing islands, and pit them against each other, um, freezing attacker transceiver, and adding countermeasures, which I think would be a particularly exciting thing, and even countermeasures to the attacker to see if somebody's trying to uh, counter its work. That is about the end of my presentation, so I thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, shameless plug, join us, work on this. If not, um, you can go get the code uh, a little later tonight from this URL up on WordPress. And I recommend some extra books here that I find very interesting. This one here, Evolve to Win, is free. Fascinating, not necessarily Cartesian genetic, but it's a fascinating read on uh, gaming strategies. And I, I think all of this has been very exciting, very exciting for me, and I look forward to seeing what you guys can do when you take a communication protocol engine and drop it into things dynamically. So thank you very much, and we'll take a few questions. And please remain seated till we finished. And he has some more T-shirts to give out. So, yeah. <laughs> so the first question comes already from the IRC. The one question is, how do you de debug an algorithm generated by this? Uh, very carefully. Um, <laughs> you usually, uh, you, I print them out. I print them out. You saw some of the, uh, the photos here. The, um, you know, I might print that out to trace, trace through that by hand, but in general, you need to run it through the simulation. And as long as we're waiting, I'll toss up a few other images. So here is a packet received program that was evolved for the transceiver. And here is an attacker's program. The attacker gets pretty vicious. 
All right, that was a good question. How do you debug this? And you really need to trust your simulation. You do some, you do some test, uh, you do some test runs. Maybe remove randomness. <coughs> Can't give you a T-shirt. Sorry, it was a good one though. <laughs> he needs to come down if he's here. <laughs> okay, next question I think was here. I have considered that there might uh, be more than one attacker at a given time. So you could have, you could have uh, the attackers punished if another attacker was better than a given attacker? <laughs> no, I've not played, uh, I've not considered a community of attackers. I presume that the attackers would pool their resources for cracking keys as opposed to launching multiple independent attacks. However, the system being chromosomes with an attacker just being a chromosome, you could easily launch as many of those as you need and add them to the system. That would be very interesting to see if multiple attackers can actually swarm it. That would be fascinating. Join me, download, write, join. Wear this while you do it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if you had tried your uh, uh, generated attackers against your manually created uh, protocols from your initial attempts. No, I have not. Um, the code bases are so wildly different. Um, the manually created one actually has fairly poor support tools around it. So I haven't been able to really fit that in. I'd love to though. Next question. That was great. I love that one. Can we get this back to you? Oh yeah, I, I will. When I'm in the area, I would say. Out of t-shirts, sorry. Hello. You mentioned that uh, power is very precious on the rover. Yes. And uh, obviously the complexity of the circuit is going to be proportional to, to power usage, presumably. Yes. And that the circuits with an attack are about 50% more complex. Um, what are your thoughts on that trade-off? And is there any scoring in there based on complexity? It's a necessary evil. We have to, we have to plan on at least, at least one governmental attacker on our mission to the moon. Um, large resources. I think it would be it would be irresponsible not to plan on at least one attacker, you know, taking or taking a run at it. So it's a necessary evil. I wish I would love to cut the resources down, but I, no luck. More questions? Do There's you, one here in the back. Do you penalize uh, code complexity in the ah? That is, a, that is a common thing to do in Cartesian genetic programming, is to, is to count the number of active genes against as a penalty. And it's been found through other experiments, you know, in uh, the books I've read and such, that you don't want to do that until you've achieved a perfect execution or near perfect execution. So I have a provision in the code to say if you ever execute perfectly, all data gets through perfectly, um, no doubles, no nothing, then to, um, to include the complexity as a penalty. But don't kick that in prematurely. And um, in the, before the attacker, that would happen. That would kick in. Uh, after the attacker, it hasn't happened yet. But it is, important to, to, it is an important tool to have in there. It's a simple little if case. It's easy to add. Um, you're invol uh, evolving the attacker and the communication protocol um, together. Yes. Um, does this mean that um, a later evolution of the communication protocol can be um, attacked by an earlier attacker? Because um, the attacker, well, you are playing the, the evolved version of the attacker against the protocol. So maybe an earlier version can attack it. Yes, that is, that is a potential risk, is that an earlier attacker would have a uh, different algorithm the attacker gave up on and that the, uh, the transceiver is now vulnerable to. And I think perhaps the suggestion that was up here of trying multiple attackers um, would help address that, potentially saving old versions, random, randomly sampling old versions of the attacker and reintroducing them into the population would help. But um, I don't want to do that until I get this ported to a GPU. I have to be pragmatic, but uh, that would be, that'd be very helpful. But yeah, it's a vulnerability. More question? Please raise your hand so that I can find you. There's one. One moment, please. Anyone that's asked questions or just hasn't, um, I do have a little swag, some pens from NVIDIA and some part-time scientist stickers. You'll see me afterwards while we're uh, driving around. Yes. 
Okay. Um, so, when do you want to? Uh, obviously, some of the calculations you can simplify them, and it's pretty easy. It would be pretty easy to recognize certain genes as possibilities for simplification. But would this affect the output if you simplified before, too early in the generations? Is what I'd like to say. Yes. It, yeah. It you, turns out bad. You you simplify. Uh, let's say you simplify this no op. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remove this no op entirely and just route this one over to here mm -hmm. and remove that gene entirely. Now you've removed the ability to come in and mutate that to say a uh, negative or a different oh. operation. And that does seem to affect the Cartesian genetic programming. You almost, you want to leave in the bloat mm -hmm. for as long as possible and only optimize at the end when you, when you harvest. Because it really does seem to affect the, the, run, the reliability. Could, could it be possible also to run the same process in like kind of a MapReduce environment? It seems like it would be possible. Yes, that would be the islanding, which would be to, uh, be to, to run hundreds of different communication protocol simulations, maybe starting from different random seeds uh, separately, and then see what the best one is. Another one might be to uh, take the different worlds you construct and then farm them out to a grid or a cluster and have, the, have them executed remotely and come back. The, uh, the Julian Miller who invented the technique, he would, take, uh, he would take these and compile them to C code and then route that C code to NVIDIA CUDA cards on dozens of computers across the lab. Um, oh yeah, running a bit out of time, so is there one very, very important question now missing? No, then I would prefer to end the talk now and you can talk with him a bit later on.